evening, everyone. My name is Robert Hayes. I'm the community outreach librarian here at the Tewksbury Public Library. And uh, we will be starting in about 30 seconds or so. We're just gonna wait for everyone to file on in from the waiting room. So I'm gonna give it another 30 seconds or so, but I wanna thank everyone for joining us. And um, for those that are in the room with us, um, if you feel comfortable doing so, certainly no obligation, but uh, if you feel comfortable doing so, uh, feel free in the chat to let us know where you're joining us from tonight. Uh, so if you'd uh, like to do so, no pressure, let us know what city or town you're watching from tonight. And we will be starting momentarily. All right, wonderful. Chumsford, Melrose, North Andover, Andover, Irving. Lots of Andovers. That's excellent. Tewksbury, thank goodness, Joan. Tewksbury, Andover. All right. Well, keep them coming. North Andover, wonderful, Judy. Great. Uh, wonderful. Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, again, my name is Robert Hayes, Community Outreach Librarian and Head of Technical Services at the Tewksbury Public Library. And I think enough of us are uh, here uh, now that we can, we can officially get started. I uh, wanna thank everyone for joining us. Uh, just to note, I am recording um, tonight's presentation. Uh, we are in Zoom webinar mode, so you don't have to worry about you know, your image or your video getting captured. Uh, the, the Zoom recording will only uh, focus on uh, my camera and uh, then on Ann's camera. But just so you know, we are recording the event and we'll, we're also streaming live on the Tewksbury Library's Facebook page. So feel free to visit that page and give us a like and, and share the video as we go. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, you can type them into the Q&A. If you have any comments during the presentation, you can type them into the chat and uh, we will get to uh, both comments and questions uh, at the end of the presentation. Uh, just to set expectations, I anticipate this program lasting approximately an hour. Uh, the presentation will probably go 50 to 55 minutes, uh, and then we'll take five to 10 minutes of questions. Uh, look for, any, for those that are joining us live on Zoom, uh, look for an email from me tomorrow morning with a link to a feedback survey. Uh, let us know what you thought of uh, tonight's event and what you'd like to see for future events here uh, at the Tewksbury Library. And I will also share the survey results with all of the other partnering libraries, uh, whom I will thank momentarily. But before I do, I wanted to quickly plug an upcoming program uh, next Thursday, March 25th, uh, here in Tewksbury and in many of our uh, partnering libraries, they're hosting a lot of uh, Women's History uh, Month programs. Uh, we have one next Thursday, March 25th, called Yale Needs Women, how the first group of girls rewrote the rules of an Ivy League. Uh, so an author named Ann Perkins will be here to give a presentation uh, based on her aforementioned book. Uh, but the really neat thing is Ann is going to be um, joined by two subjects um, from her book, uh, Virginia Tyson and Betsy Hartman. Uh, both women arrived as first year students at Yale in 1969, which was the start of co-education there. And they're gonna give us their firsthand account of what their experience was like. So that'll be awfully neat. And that is next Thursday, March 25th, seven o'clock, Yale Needs Women is the name of the book and also the name of the presentation. And I will put a link to that with uh, some more information in the chat. Let's see if I can manage that. All right, so let's get to the good stuff now. All right, so tonight's presentation, Short Skirts, Oh My, History of Women's Rights. When Abigail Adams begged her husband to, quote, remember the ladies, unquote, in drafting a new code of laws, John wrote back that he, quote, could not but laugh, unquote, at her extraordinary suggestion. While it took almost 150 years, in the early part of the 20th century, women were working, voting, and experiencing the first taste of freedoms unheard of before. Uh, in tonight's presentation, award-winning storyteller and historian Ann Barrett traces the exciting social and historical milestones in the fight for women's rights. 
And I want to thank the uh, Friends of the Libraries uh, in Tewksbury, Andover, North Andover, and North Reading. And I also want to thank the staff at the Memorial Hall Library in Andover, Stevens Memorial Library in North Reading, and Flint Memorial Library. Oh, I screwed that up. Stevens Memorial Library in North Andover and Flint Memorial Library in North Reading for partnering with Tewksbury uh, to bring this program to you tonight. Uh, so all of us on the line, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Anne for joining us here tonight. And Anne, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Robert, for inviting me to speak to this evening. And thank you to all of you for inviting me into your living rooms, kitchens, studies, wherever we happen to be joining together through the magic of Zoom. The 1920s represented an exciting new time for women with new freedoms and opportunities so greatly expanded from anything that women had experienced before. Could probably not have been imagined by their grandmothers or possibly even their mothers. In the 1920s, conservative opinion proclaimed loudly that women had become something completely different, had changed had come, become something completely different from what they had always been. Women, they said, were at the vortex of a fiery revolution, part of the new flaming youth. They bobbed their hair, shortened their skirts, carried bootleg gin in their garters, and danced into the small hours of the morning. In general, they thumbed their noses at the dull conventional worlds of their mothers and turned their backs on old American virtues. This is what conservative opinion said about women in the 1920s. And these are easy generalizations passed down to us, but like all such sweeping characterizations, they are only part of the story. One essential correction to this is this oversimplified view of the out of control female in the roaring 20s. And part of it was that this had suddenly happened. But American women did not suddenly make themselves over, perhaps because of the rumble seat and its purported uses, uh, nor was it even the consequence of the 19th Amendment giving women the right to vote. American women had been changing for quite some time. Yes, more rapidly as we led up to the 1920s, but had been changing for quite some time before then. For decades, they had been seeing themselves in a new light and seeking a new place for themselves in the scheme of things. So tonight we're gonna journey through the decades leading up to this revolution. And we're gonna start back at a time when skirts were long, opportunities were short, and women's dreams had not yet been realized. In 1776, Abigail Adams is known to have written to her husband, John, then attending the Continental Congress. She wrote, I long to hear that you have declared an independence. And by the way, in the new code of laws that I suppose will be necessary for you to make, I desire that you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. John wrote back, as to your extraordinary code of laws, I cannot but laugh. But in his letter, he did go on to acknowledge that women in their own way held and wielded quite a bit of power already albeit rather in the background. Mm -hmm. And he went on to say, why would they codify something that in so many respects was already true? Rights for women were exceedingly limited. Before the Married Woman's Property Act of 1848, a married woman could not control her property, even if it was property that had belonged to her prior to her marriage. Control of all of her assets, wealth, income, control of her very person and the persons of any children that she had by a previous marriage, control of all of that passed to her husband. 
Unfortunately, too often a woman would marry to discover belatedly that it was her wealth rather than her person, which her hu new husband was interested in. Before the 1848 Married Women's Property Act, some states had put together other laws to address this issue, but by and large, women's rights over their own property were very limited. Of course, there are always exceptions. As a single woman of property in Maryland in the mid 19th century, Margaret Brent, uh, pictured on the left in a woodcut, uh, filed suit against her debtors, and she's here in court uh, representing herself in this woodcut uh, illustration. She occasionally acted as an attorney. She also uh, represented her brother Giles in his business interests as well in filing suit against debtors. She was a very controversial figure, but she was a woman of wealth and therefore could get away with perhaps more than other women. And there are undoubtedly others that were like her that have simply passed from history. In 1756, Lydia Taft was the first woman legally allowed to vote in colonial America. After the death of her wealthy husband and also her son, uh, there, was, there was a lack of an adult heir to represent the family interests. And therefore she was granted by vote at a meeting of Uxbridge, Massachusetts, she was granted the right to vote. Deborah Sampson, pictured on the right, took a different approach to the challenges of being a female in a man's world. She disguised herself as a young man. She uh, dressed herself up, bound herself up, uh, and put on a uniform and presented herself for enlistment during the revolution as Robert Shirtleff. She was injured several times, but escaped detection. And it wasn't until she contracted brain fever that he, the attending physician discovered her secret. But instead of divulging that secret, uh, she was moved to a more private quarters where she would be able to convalesce. And it is said that at the conclusion of the revolution, George Washington himself signed an order for her to receive a soldier's pension. Education for women took place in their homes or on a limited basis in schools. And I say limited because, for example, Susan B. Anthony, the noted suffragist, she was denied the opportunity to study certain subjects while attending school because they were not appropriate for young ladies to study. A woman was educated, if she received any education at all, she was educated with an eye to her future role as one to provide rudimentary education to her children. We're all familiar with the um, sampler pictured here. This was a way for girls to learn their letters and numbers and at the same time practice the very important skill of needlework that would be required uh, that they be able to employ as uh, mistresses of their own households. So, a woman would provide a rudimentary education to her children, reading, writing, basic figures, and then depending upon the family circumstances, boys would go on to further education outside the home. It would later be written that the history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man toward woman, having indirect object, establishing an absolute tyranny over her. Limited education had historically been a large part of this tyranny. However, in 1821, the Troy Female Seminary, the first endowed school for women was founded in New York, in Troy, New York by Emma Willard. Emma was a successful teacher and educational administrator when she wrote a pamphlet entitled, A Plan for Improving Female Education. And in this pamphlet, she laid out the many benefits that society as a whole would reap by improving the education of women. She petitioned the state of New York for funds to establish a school, but she was denied. However, the city of Troy raised $4,000 and said that they would establish such a school if she agreed to come and run it, which she did. 
the education that was offered to these young women was comparable to a college preparatory education for boys, including trigonometry, zoology, natural philosophy, uh, history, uh, and chemistry and such. Emma knew that some of her students would go on to run households, and so she also offered courses in home economics and home management and such. If she wasn't, uh, if she couldn't find a book that uh, suited her curriculum needs, she wrote it. She would write them. And as a matter of fact, I have one here uh, that happened to be passed down to me in my own family library. It is the Abridged History of the United States of Republic of America by Emma Willard, 1845. And so Emma set about writing books when she needed them. The Troy Female Seminary became a model for female and comprehensive education for women. And it also proved that women had the ability to learn and excel in all subjects. Contrary to what some believed, some even questioned the effect on a woman's health of attaining a further education. As late as 1873, a gentleman named Dr. Edward Clark in his widely respected book, Sex and Education, uh, Dr. Clark wrote, a girl can study and learn, but she cannot do all this and retain uninjured health and a future secure from neuralgia, uterine disease, hysteria, and other derangements of the nervous system. In 1833, Oberlin College became the first co-educational college in the United States. As we all know, knowledge is power, and women were making the first steps with this education. They were making the first steps on a powerful journey that would take them and last nearly a century. At about the same time, in publishing the book, Course of Popular Lectures, Fanny Wright, pictured here, became one of the first women to actually write about suffrage. Prior to that, there was really no discussion or even thought that women would be allowed any sort of suffrage or any kind of voting rights at all. Fanny Wright was from Scotland, and she moved to the United States to found a socialist colony in Tennessee on land she had purchased fashioned after a social, socialist colony that she had observed in um, Indiana. Wright was a correspondent. She was a guest of such luminaries as Thomas Jefferson and the Marquis de Lafayette. She was the first woman to edit a journal, the Harmony Gazette, and she was the first woman to hold a series of lectures before both men and women. Women making public address and most certainly making public address to a mixed gender audience was unheard of and considered extremely improper. Some aspects of Wright's community were extremely controversial, especially her decision to encourage sexual freedom. Wright said that matrimony was a discriminatory institution and she encouraged free love. She also developed her own dress code for women that consisted of ankle-length pantalettes, a knee-length skirt, and a bodice. And this, a similar style was uh, adopted by later feminists or later in the 1800s. In her book, Wright wrote, however novel it may appear, I shall venture the assertion that until women assume the place in society which good sense and good feeling alike must assign to them, human improvement must advance but feebly. It is in vain that we would circumscribe the power of one half of our race, and that half by far the most important and influential. In 1840, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott met at an international anti-slavery convention in London, where they had both been sent as delegates. And they were outraged when the men of that assembly voted to prevent women attendees from making any kind of public address at the convention or even being seen. 
they created a cordoned off area behind curtains so that the women could view the proceedings but could not be seen at those proceedings. This experience galvanized these women into taking further action concerning women's rights. In 1848, the first Women's Rights Convention in the United States was held in Seneca Falls, New York, organized by Stanton, Mott, and several other women. Many of the participants, as pictured here in this, uh, this picture of the, of the convention, many of these participants signed the Declaration of Sentiments and Resolutions, which outlined the main issues and goals of the emerging women's movement. And I have that document and I just wanna read a little bit of it to you to give you a flavor of what this Declaration of Sentiments and Resolutions really meant. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted, deriving their powers from the consent of the governed. Whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these rights, it is the right of those who suffer from it to refuse allegiance to it and to insist upon the institution of a new government. The history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpation on the part of man toward woman, having in direct option the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He closes against her all the avenues to wealth and distinction which he considers most honorable to himself. As a teacher of theology, medicine, or law, she is not known. He has denied her the facilities for obtaining a thorough education. He has endeavored in every way that he could to destroy her confidence in her own powers, to lessen her self-respect, and to make her willing to lead a dependent and abject life. Because women do feel themselves aggrieved, oppressed, and fraudulently deprived of their most sacred rights, we insist that they have immediate admission to all the rights and privileges which belong to them as citizens of the United States. This convention marked the beginning of regularly held women's meetings. Now try to take yourselves back and imagine that women organizing themselves and acting independently from men was a new concept. To compare, for example, this book published in 1848, in which I actually have a copy of, this book was published the same year as that women's convention. It focuses on the proper behavior of women because up until that time, with the exception of some of the breakaway women that we've discussed so far, a woman's appearance, behavior, and reputation were all she had to trade upon to get her by in the world. For example, according to this little tome, a lady's behavior in the street should be modest, dignified, yet pleasant and engaging. Never stare, never giggle, never walk with a wriggle or sway from side to side. Ladies are not allowed upon any ordinary occasion to take the arm of any but a male relative or an accepted male suitor. A question posed by a stranger beyond the most necessary of questions should be considered a gross insult and repelled with proper spirit. The Civil War disrupted many suffragist activities as women turned their energies to war work, serving as nurses, fundraisers, spies, and even a few again in disguise as soldiers. They were also running households and businesses and farms and families while their husbands, sons, and fathers were away for months or years. But this war work provided training ground for many women, women to learn organizational and occupational skills. And many women would take what they learned during the war and turn it towards suffrage activities at the conclusion of the war. In 1870, the 15th Amendment gave the right to vote to the black male population. 
disagreement over this amendment caused a split in the American Equal Rights Association, which had been formed in 1866. It was formed uh, with the direct object of universal suffrage for both black men as well as white and black women, but only black men were given the vote. So this organization disagreed about that and split into two. Stanton and Anthony formed the National Women's Suffrage Association. Anthony had been a lifelong abolitionist, but at this point, she began to turn more of her energies towards suffrage. Lucy Stone, from Massachusetts, along with others, organized the Boston-based American Women's Suffrage Association. She attended Oberlin, <clears throat> and she was the first woman in Massachusetts to earn a college degree. She was asked to write the commencement speech. However, she declined the honor because although she would have written the speech, it would be required that a male colleague deliver the speech. Women making public address was still considered improper. Years later, Oberlin invited her to come back and make a, con a commencement speech. In 1850, Stone was a leader in organizing the first National Women's Rights Convention in Worcester, Massachusetts. And you might say, well, I thought there already was one in 1848, but that was a more local affair. This Worcester Convention in, in 1850 was national and drew people from much further afield. Lucy Stone is remembered, uh, especially for one first, she was the first woman to retain her maiden name after marriage. Uh, and this caused her no small amount of grief. She was living in, I believe it was Cambridge, and she wanted to run for the school board because women were allowed to take positions, some municipal positions such as um, uh, on the school board. But the uh, town fathers did not want her to run unless she ran under her husband's name as uh, Mrs. Lucy Blackwell. While we're talking about Massachusetts, I just want to mention uh, a couple of other um, women who were important at that time frame, and one of them is is from uh, has a has a connection to Massachusetts. Uh, on the left is Victoria Claflin Woodhull. Uh, Claflin, the Claflin family was from Wenham, Massachusetts. Uh, this is actually the Claflin Richards House is um, a historic house in Wenham. Uh, she was descended from the Claflin family. Uh, and during the latter half of the 19th century, she was a very colorful character. She was a spiritualist, an actress. She established the first women's brokerage, stock brokerage. Uh, she was an advocate of free love. And she ran for president, kind of. Uh, she um, did not make it onto any uh, state ballots. Uh, by the time she, uh, by the time the election came along, she actually had been jailed for something else that she had done. Um, but she, she did at least put her name out there uh, for president. On the right pictured is Belva Lockwood. Belva actually did run for president in 1884 and again in 1888. She managed to get into some state ballots, get her ballot into some state uh, voting um, processes. And she received about 4,000 or so uh, votes in 1884 and a few less, than, uh, some less in uh, 1888. And just to give you an idea of what Belva was up against, this is called a Mother Hubbard uh, parade. Uh, men dressed up in nightgowns and bonnets to, uh, to campaign for Belva uh, in, in her um, bid for the presidency. In 1874, the Women's Christian Temperance Union was formed. And in addition to becoming a powerful voice against the evils of liquor, it also was an important voice and force in the fight for suffrage. Not surprisingly, the liquor industry was opposed to women getting the right to vote. They feared that if women could vote, liquor consumption would be outlawed. In 1878, a women's suffrage amendment was introduced to the United States Congress, but it didn't pass. It is interesting to note though, that many individual states did pass some suffrage legislation prior to 1920, as we can see on this map. The olive states gave women no voting rights. 
In the light orange states, women could vote in the presidential election. In the dark orange states, women could vote in the primaries. And in the blue states, women had full voting rights. And this was probably for a couple of reasons. First of all, women were very instrumental and very important force in um, expanding and, and moving the, the, um, the frontier, moving out to the frontier. Uh, so they were a very important force out there. And it was quite possibly also an inducement for women to come to the frontier uh, because they would be recognized by being given full, um, full voting rights. However, suffragists felt that nothing short of a constitutional amendment would guarantee them their full rights. In 1890, the organization that had split um, into two was reunited again under one, and it was uh, initially run by Elizabeth Cady Stanton, but many felt she was still too radical, and so she resigned after only a couple of years. Now, you might think that every woman would have been in favor of women getting the right to vote, but that wasn't true. In 1911, the National Association Opposed to Women's Suffrage was formed, and it was organized by a group of wealthy and influential women, as well as some Catholic clergymen. Um, it was further uh, endorsed uh, by distillers and brewers, conservative Southern congressmen, and some large corporate capitalists, even um, fairly locally in uh, the Salem Evening News, the newspaper out of Salem, the Salem Evening News headline declared on uh, February 6, 1912, Wenham women oppose suffrage. So why would they oppose suffrage? Well, here's a poster showing what would happen if women had the right to vote. As you can see, there's holes in the children's stockings. The lamp has run out of oil. There's probably nothing to eat on the stove either. And the home is just falling apart. This is what would happen if women had the right to vote. There were any number of reasons why people felt that women um, didn't need or shouldn't have the right to vote. Among them were the following. No woman who may vote will attend to her domestic duties. As we've just seen, that's what will happen to her household. It will make dissension between husband and wife. Men and women are so much alike that men can represent a woman's views. Women will vote as her husband tells her to. Hmm. Women will form a solid party and outvote men, which is probably what they were most afraid of. But this is my favorite one. Women have no powers of organization. Despite this, in 1912, Theodore Roosevelt's Progressive Party became the first national political party to adopt a woman, women's suffrage plank in the bid for presidency. Finally, suffragists were making some real political headway. However, Roosevelt didn't win. Woodrow Wilson became the next president and he was anti-suffrage. During the early teens, the National Women's Party organized hunger strikes and picketing. At first, Wilson was tolerant and tried to look the other way, but eventually he ordered the protesters, many of the protesters jailed, where they received much publicized ill treatment, beatings, force feedings and the like. It became an enormous embarrassment for the White House and eventually those jailed were released. In 1917, the United States entered World War I and almost immediately, the Wilson administration called on women to support the war effort. All over the country, thousands of women massed behind the war. They volunteered their services. They joined drives to sell liberty bonds and war saving stamps um, to help the government finance the war. They sold, sold these bonds and stamps at club meetings and on street corners and in shops. Others helped the Red Cross provide medical supplies and services to the military, and yet others worked in no, numerous government agencies or with one of the very numerous women's wartime volunteer uh, associations that cropped up. Thousands of female volunteers had the chance for the first time in American history to wear Red Cross and other uniforms that marked them as people of influence and skill. And thousands more had the unprecedented, unprecedented opportunity uh, to 
serve in the military as certain uh, positions were open to women, for women to fill. During the fall of 1917, the United States Employment Service recognized that thousands of women would have to work in the war industries. Women came out of their homes to do the jobs that the government needed and the, provide the services for the country that the country so desperately needed. And by the winter of 1917, 1918, it was clear that women would have to take over jobs that had always been considered men's work. And the picture here is uh, women uh, working at a welding uh, plant. Now, in the view of suffragists, the fact that women were being called upon to support the war effort in such important ways just further reinforced the argument that women devoted de deserved the right to vote. The National American Suffrage Association, under the direction of Carrie Chapman Catt, pictured here, formed a plan to coordinate a nationwide suffrage lobbying uh, at the state and federal level. They employed success, what had been traditionally successful men's tactics, where they would meet with politicians and other leaders, and they would uh, leverage those in favor to work on those who were opposed and, and get them to come around. In 1918, Wilson came around to their point of view, encouraging the House and Senate to pass the amendment, saying it was an act of right and justice to the women of the country and of the world. But still, it failed to pass. Finally, in 1919, it did pass, but then it needed to be ratified by at least 36 states. 35 states ratified it, and all eyes turned to Tennessee. Now, as you might remember, on the state map we looked at earlier, Tennessee was one of those olive colored states that granted women no voting rights. It was a very conservative area. The vote looked to be extremely tight and there was really no clear winner. The fight was on and it was called the War of the Roses. Uh, those delegates in favor of suffrage wore yellow roses, those opposed wore red roses. The swing vote was in question held by Harry Byrne, a young representative. And when I say young, he was about 24 years old. His earlier actions and statements had conflicted. It was not clear how he would vote, but it seemed likely that he would probably vote with his constituency against the amendment. And as a matter of fact, he might have done just that had it not been for a letter from his mother. Feb Byrne, pictured in the lower right corner, was an independent-minded widow caring for a farm in Tennessee, but she found time to keep up on the progress of the suffrage movement. She said that recent news about the uncertainty of the outcome finally compelled her to write to her son, voicing her sentiments. She wrote, hurrah and vote for suffrage and don't keep them in doubt. I noticed Chandler's speech, it was very bitter. I've been waiting to see how you stood, but have not seen anything yet. Don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat with her rats. Is she the one that put rat in ratification? Ha, no more from mama this time. With lots of love, mama. And so Tennessee became the 36th state to ratify the amendment. Women had finally won the right to vote. Now I'm often asked, so I actually added in just a little bit into this presentation because I'm often, I'm often asked, how does the United States compare to other uh, countries in, the, in this respect? And this could be a whole presentation unto itself, but just some of the brief highlights. Um, in the 18th century, Swedish and Polish women who paid taxes were uh, uh, allowed voting rights, although Sweden later rescinded those rights. In the 19th century, Finnish Taxpaying women were vote, were granted municipal voting rights. And later in 1906, they were the first country to vote in universal suffrage. Late in the 19th century, the women of the UK were, were granted um, local voting rights, but they did not get full suffrage until 1928. Many countries came in ahead of the United States, including Poland, Denmark, Austria, 
Belgium and New Zealand. Others arrived after the United States, including South Africa in 1930, France in 1945, and Greece in 1952. And we continue right up until this day, into the 21st century with Oman and Kuwait. So what happened next? Let's switch gears completely and talk about fashion and its role as an indicator of the transformation. Between 1900 and the mid 1920s, the feminine ideal in America underwent a remarkable and virtually complete metamorphosis. At the turn of the century, the Gibson girl pictured here defined the age. The phrase was made popular by Charles Dana Gibson, a um, um, public publication illustrator of the time. The Gibson girl was defined by long hair swept up to uh, display a high brow. She had a narrow waist, well-concealed legs, and a wifely and maternal manner. The Gibson girl always appeared aloof and seemingly incapable of any immodest thought or deed. She was cultured and intelligent, but would not mix in politics or the like. By the 1920s, the Gibson girl had vanished and in her place was the flapper. Quite unlike the Gibson girl, the flapper cut off her hair, concealed her forehead, de-emphasized her curves and showed as much leg as possible. She also wore plenty of makeup, something the Gibson girl would never have done. During the first half of the 1920s, skirt length became the boiling point for this social revolution. Since 1915, skirts had been drifting up slowly till right after World War I, hems were up about six to seven inches. By 1920, restraint had been all thrown to the wind and uh, the skirts had gone up another five to six inches. And the shorter skirt was not the only major development in women's fashion. The entire ensemble was lightened and simplified. Gone were corsets and chemises and petticoats and such. The Journal of Commerce in 1928 declared that the amount of cloth required to make up a woman's ensemble dropped from 19 and a half yards in 1913 to seven yards in 1928. The 1920s also witnessed an explosion of beauty shops expanding from 5,000 in 1920 to 40,000 in 1930. Sales of cosmetics in that same period jumped 400%. While women's expanding polit uh, political opportunities contributed to the sense of the new woman, so too did uh, changes in work were important as well. World War I had brought short-term opportunities for a variety of jobs for women to work in. In addition, new business technologies like typing and stenography uh, op opened up more and more white collar sorts of work. Women flocked to this white collar work which carried status and was better paid than the factory labor that many of them had um, been employed in. Clerical work became increasingly dominated by women and expanded from just uh, stenography and typing to also bookkeeping and clerking and such. More than 88,000 women were employed as telephone operators. And by 1917, 99% of all switchboard operators were women. At the turn of the century, young working women had most often lived at home, or if that was not possible, they boarded with a local family close to where they were working. In the 1920s, between school and marriage, uh, young women began to live in their own apartments, often sharing them with other young working women. Having their own apartments gave women a sense of autonomy and adulthood and being unsupervised and unrestrained. It gave their parents a lot of worry, with good reason. Jazz was all the rage and the newspaper, the New York American, a very conservative paper, reported its results on the national character saying moral disaster is coming to hundreds of young American women through the pathological, nerve-irritating, sex-exciting 
music of jazz orchestras. In two years in Chicago alone, the Illinois Vigilance Association reported the downfall of a thousand girls could be traced directly to the pernicious influence of jazz music. A social worker reported on the unwholesome excitement that she now encountered even at small town dances in the Midwest. Boy and girl couples left the dance hall in a state of dangerous disturbance. Bathtub gin, jazz, jumpy jazz music, suggestive couples dancing, and short skirts all led to a new era of relaxed sexual norms. Rudolph Valentino, pictured here, made millions of women swoon. Branded shake condoms, pictured uh, at the bottom of this uh, slide, held all the promise of romantic Valentino-esque liaisons. One father of the time described his experience thus, I was sure my girls had never experimented with a hip pocket flask, flirted with other women's husbands, or smoked cigarettes. My wife entertained the same smug delusion and was saying something like that at the dinner table one day. And then she began to talk about a girl my daughter associated with, saying, they tell me that that Purvis girl has cigarette parties at her home. Elizabeth, my daughter, was eyeing her mother with curious eyes. She made no reply, but turning to me right there at the table, she said, Dad, let's see your cigarettes. Without the slightest suspicion of what was forthcoming, I threw Elizabeth my cigarettes. She withdrew one from the package, tapped it on the back of her left wrist, inserted it between her lips, reached over and took my lighted cigarette from my mouth, lit it her own cigarette and blew airy rings toward the ceiling. My wife nearly fell out of her chair and I might have fallen out of mine had I not been momentarily too stunned. Young working women often model their behavior and their dreams on the movies. In the 1920s, movie stars had replaced political, business, and artistic leaders as role models for these young people. And ironically, the movies had in turn picked out their themes based upon the lives of young working women who made up a good portion of their audience. Films showed office workers and department store clerks working amid uh, wealthy male boss bosses and also customers as well. And according to the movies, with some pluck and spunk and cleverness, you could marry the boss. In 1928, 39% of college graduates were women, up from 19% at the turn of the century. That same year, women began to compete in track and field events at the Olympics. The first Olympics held in 1896 did not include any women's events. The opinion being by the officials, the Olympic officials, that women's comp the women competition would be impractical, uninteresting, unesthetic, and incorrect. They began to compete in 1900 in lawn tennis and golf. Women's swimming was added in 1912, but American women did not compete at that first swimming event because America required its female athletes to wear skirts, and it is very difficult to swim in a skirt. So throughout the Roaring Twenties, women were enjoying new freedoms and work opportunities and the robust uh, prosperity of that decade as well. So let's take a quick kind of fun look at what did this all look like?
So Anne, do you know how much longer the video is? Uh, just um, another minute. Okay, great. Not even. Okay, there you go. <laughs> of course, the giddiness of the 1920s couldn't last with the stock market crash and subsequent depression through the 1930s. Some gains were even lost uh, as some states passed laws preventing um, women from taking jobs, feeling that they would be taking those jobs away from the men. But at the same time that there were gains in other areas, uh, Frances Perkins as Secretary of Labor became the first woman cabinet um, member. Jane Addams became the first woman to win the Nobel Prize, uh, Nobel Peace Prize. And Eleanor Roosevelt, of course, completely changed the role of first lady and also became the uh, ambassador, the UN ambassador. Then came World War II and many signed up to go overseas while many more went to work in the war industries once again to support their country in whatever way was required, showing that they were an equal and integral part of the fabric of our nation. And so we come back around to the foreshadowing words of Abigail Adams when she wrote, if particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves responsible and bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. How right she was, as we've seen the incredible evolution that could never have been imagined by Abigail or possibly even by the women at that first convention in 1848. It was a long road, but my with much perseverance by literally generations of women. Women won the right to vote, to work in a wide variety of careers, to wear what they wished, and in all aspects to experience the fullness of what life had to offer and make their own choices and show that they could be and would be a powerful political, economic, and cultural force here in America. Thank you. So Anne, great job, uh, as expected, as usual. Um, so we already have a couple of questions in the Q&A and I would encourage the folks on the line to get your comments and questions in. Uh, we'll uh, take at least five, hopefully 10 minutes of questions. Uh, Marie would like to know, was Woodrow Wilson's wife a suffragist? I don't know at pre uh, whether she was or not, at least to begin with. I believe in the end, you know, I mean, she was she was the wife of the president, so she kind of had to toe the line. Um, and I don't think that she was public about it, but uh, I believe that she was interested in <laughs> in having it happen. Great. Uh, Kathy says, great lecture, so well presented. Thank you, great job. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks a great question. Uh, where do women of color fit into this history? It seems most of the women highlighted in the presentation are white, and I'm interested to know about the women of color during this period. That's an excellent question, and um, I don't have uh, a really good answer for it. Um, it's an excellent question, and I don't really have anything you know, to, to add to what I've already put in. That's something certainly worth looking into. And uh, it's certainly more modern day, but I, I'll just note that uh, next Wednesday, March 24th, uh, we're having a presentation on the mothers of Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and James Baldwin. Oh, uh, and the name of that presentation is called The Three Mothers, and that's with author uh, Anna Tubbs. And that's Wednesday, March 24th at 7 o'clock. So uh, different, uh, different times, but, uh, but something that may be of interest to some folks on the line. Uh, does anyone have any additional comments or questions to Anna before we wrap up? Uh, Elena says, uh, thank you. Um, let me see. Yeah, going once, going twice. All right, so I think we'll wrap it there. Anne, do you have any uh, last words you want to give to the group before we log off? Thank you very much for inviting me to speak this evening and uh, have a wonderful evening, everyone. 
Yeah, thanks, Ann. Want to thank Ann. Want to thank Andover. Want to thank North Andover. Want to thank North Reading. And want to thank uh, Tewksbury for joining us tonight. Uh, look for that feedback survey uh, in your email inbox tomorrow morning. And I hope everyone has a great night. Thanks again. Thank you, Ann. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.